Hey guys, Troy here. Happy Sunday to you. Hope you're doing well. Um, yes, I don't do many videos from my vehicle, but you, you do what you have to do, right? Sometimes. Um, I hope you're doing well. You know, I, you know, I know there's a lot going on. <laughs> when isn't there a lot going on um, uh, these days? But, you know, I just want to remind you that, that God is still on the throne, you know, and we are walking by faith. We're not living in crisis. Um, keep your eyes on Jesus, you know, fear the Lord. Don't fear man. Uh, fear the Lord. Don't walk around in fear of illness. Um, continue to trust Christ. Um, and when those fears and concerns do pop up, which would be quite normal and rational in this day and age, just give them to the Lord. Pray through them. You know, read scriptures and comfort yourself with the truth of his presence. But this morning I wanted to, to talk with you about humility. I wanted to talk with you specifically about humility and spiritual awakening and how essential it is. You know, humility is really one of those qualities that we really admire in somebody else. It's really hard to live by. It's really hard to embrace. Um, and yet, it's essential. It's essential to spiritual awakening and growth. It, it's, it's essential to the spiritual healing that Christ can provide. Only Christ can provide. Um, I'm reminded of an old song uh, from my childhood. It goes like this. Come every soul by sin oppressed. There's mercy with the Lord, and He will surely give you rest by trusting in His Word. Only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust Him now. He will save you, He will save you, He will save you now. What a beautiful old hymn, Only Trust Him. Uh, who are you trusting right now? Are you trusting in the Word of God? You know, the Word of God is where we find the information and the truth that we need to make educated decisions. Um, and to develop our worldview. You know, the opposite, Scripture teaches us that the opposite of humility is pride. You know, what is pride? You know, uh, I'm not talking about a healthy sense of, I'm proud of my children for the people they turned out to be. I'm, I'm talking about self-exaltation and arrogance and being, and being puffed up, which is what pride really means. It means to elevate oneself. Um, Pride, in my opinion, is often, it's rooted in fear. And it's inspired by our enemy. When I say the enemy, I'm referring to Satan. His, continually, his continual uh, assault on, on the image of God in man. Always attacking, always demeaning, um, and deceiving. And, and I think pride is part of that deception, um, and sometimes we fall into the trap of pride and our own ignorance and our own desire uh, to want to be loved, to want to be acknowledged, to be important, and fear, fear that we're, we're being judged by others or looked down upon or that we don't really matter. Um, you know, pride numbs us to the sting of our own failures, both presumed and, and actual Pride's a destroyer of relationships. I mean, how many marriages are destroyed by pride? How many friendships are destroyed by a refusal to practice humility? You know, in an, in an effort to elevate ourselves, we push others away. That's what pride does. But you know, that's true of us and God as well. Our pride pushes God away from us. We cannot, Scripture teaches us that we cannot receive the healing, the spirit, I'm talking about that spiritual healing and transformation. Um, as long as our chief aim is to elevate ourselves. 
So the con on the contrary, on the other side, the flip side of the coin is that humility restores relationship. I've seen humility restore marital relationships and friendships. Um, and even uh, more importantly, humility allows us to receive the gift of forgiveness and eternal life, the gift of God's love and presence in our, in our life. You know, I, I want to remind you of a, a passage of scripture from Second Chronicles. It was written, the scripture is written to, the, to God's people. It's written to the nation of Israel. But, you know, I think that we can learn a great deal uh, from it, specifically in the area of God's conditions for spiritual awakening. I, I think you probably know it. Uh, Second Chronicles 7, chapter 7, verse 14. It says, If my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. You want to pause this and go get your Bible and open it up or, or underline that at 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. God gave four conditions in this passage of Scripture. And many sermons have been preached on it. You've probably heard, you know, several yourself. But I want to call attention to that first condition. What is it? It's humble yourselves. If my people, he says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. God's first condition, God's first prerequisite, if you will, to healing was humility. You know, this is something that's really lacking in our world. Man, we're surrounded by by arrogance. Uh, and it's easy to see it in other people, uh, but sometimes it's really difficult to see it in ourselves. You know, for example, like when we're unwilling uh, on a more personal level, when we're more when we are internally justifying our sinful behavior, making excuses, you know, that's pride. That, that's a defensive posture, uh, you know, when what we really need to do is just admit um, re- admit our sin and our need for forgiveness. And so God is saying here, the prerequisite is humble. Why do you think God, um, why do you think God starts with humility? And this might be one of those places, if you're in one of our small groups, to pause this message and, and, and discuss among yourself, why does God start with humility as He calls His people to, to a new way of living, as He desires to heal their land and forgive them? Um, do you think it's significant that God starts there? You know, there's a story in Scripture uh, in Luke chapter 18 that I think of when I think about humility, specifically the irony of humility. It's the parable that Jesus told about the, the tax collector and the Pharisee. And that's in Luke 18. I'm going to be re, uh, sharing it with you from Luke 18 verses 9 through 14, um, starting with verse 9. And I'm reading from the NIV. To some who... to To some who were confident, Jesus is teaching, right? He says, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looking down on everyone else. We we never get caught up with that, do we, guys? As, As religious people, as Christians. But these people who were getting puffed up, who were getting prideful, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. One an expert in the law, one an expert in the word of God, the other someone who was persecuting his own people and aligning themselves with the Roman government. Someone who was hated, um, hated by, by God's people. They were being persecuted and oppressed. And this person was guilty of, of joining in that. And back to back to Christ's word. So these two men, they went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, one a tax collector. And the and Jesus says that the Pharisee stood stood up by himself and he prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, those robbers and those evil doers and those adulterers, or even like this tax collector. 
right over here, this guy. Man, God, I'm glad I, I'm not in. I'm not in their shoes. I'm glad that I'm. God, I'm squared away with you. I fast twice a week, God. I give 10% of everything I make. And then Jesus starts to describe the tax collector. He says, but the tax collector, he stood off at a distance. He would not even look up. Jesus said he beat his breast and he said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus says in verse 14 of that chapter, he says, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all who will exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who will humble themselves will be exalted. That's the irony of, of humility in God's economy. The tax collector, even though he was a known sinner, even though he was guilty, he went away justified. He went away pure, clean, declared clean that, that day by God because he humbled himself before God. The, the, the Pharisee, on the other hand, he went home just like he came in, puffed up. You know, what, let's think about this for a minute. What was the basis for the Pharisee's confidence before God? The Pharisee compared himself to others. He, 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 he was looking at others and he thought, you know, at least I'm better than them. Do you ever think that way? You know, honestly, sometimes I fall into that trap. Jeez, I'm glad I'm not like that person. You know, I'm glad, man, I'm glad I don't have that addiction. I'm glad I don't do this. The Pharisee was comparing himself to others. And in his arrogance, he assumed he was heard because he had a, did a lot of religious -y stuff. He was, you know, he was there at the temple. He was giving his money. He was praying on a regular basis. And so, you know, you know, I, I say this often, you know, Jesus isn't just a behaviorist. Jesus isn't just trying to, to, to get you to behave to get you to act a certain way. Yeah. How we live is an indicator of the position of our heart. That's true of this Pharisee. This Pharisee was, he was puffed up in his own, <laughs> by his own actions, by his own religion. And he made the mistake of assuming that self-righteousness was the same as justification in the sight of God. But now let's talk about that, that, that tax collector, that known sinner. He was very different. His, he didn't. He wasn't standing up in, in the temple, you know, declaring that God. I'm glad I'm not like these people. Instead, it says that he stood off at a distance, and he wouldn't even lift his lift his head, and he beat his chest, and he acknowledged his sin before God, and he pleaded with God for help. And the Scripture says that Jesus Himself said, and is recorded in this passage, is saying. That's the guy that went home whole that day. The guy that humbled himself before Jesus and asked for help. Man, I find that liberating. How about you? Because our, 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 religi our religious behavior, our religious -y behavior, our, our doing of the things to try to confirm ourselves just... We, you know it. Come on. It just doesn't work. It still leaves us feeling a little bit empty. But God hears us if we were, will humbly come to Him and cry out for help. You know, Jesus taught His disciples the importance of, of uh, humility. Humility. I'm thinking right now of John chapter 13, verses 1 through 13, where Jesus, it's right before the fa uh, Passover festival, and G Jesus knew that the hour had come when he was going to be, he was going to leave this world, that he was going to be betrayed, that he was going to be beaten, wrongly accused, 
that he was going to be falsely tried, convicted, brutally hung on a cross, that he would die, that he would be buried and rise again on the third day. And he knew that things were going to be different from this point on. And I'm going to read to you from John chapter 13. It says, it was just before the Passover. Uh, and again, this is verses 1 through 13 John of John chapter 13. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. And having loved his own who were in the world. John says, and he loved them to the end. I love that. That, that personal, that vulnerable side of Christ that we, we meet in the scriptures. That Jesus loved these people. And he wanted to, to leave them with something important. There was some something he wanted them to know. He wanted them to know about, about God's love. He wanted them to know about, about why he came. And he wanted them to know about salvation that was available to them. And it says in verse 2, it says, The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already... Uh, prompted Judas, the son of Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put, had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. God had a redemptive plan, mind-blowing to us. Parts of it brutal, unfathomable, and yet God was working his plan, and Jesus knew that. So Jesus got up from the meal, it says, and he took off his outer clothing and he wrapped a towel around his waist and he poured water into a, into a big basin, a big bowl, and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to dry them with a towel, with that towel that he had wrapped around himself. And he came to Simon Peter, and Simon Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus said, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you'll understand. No, Peter said, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus said, unless I wash, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. And then the Lord said, then Lord, excuse me, then the Lord, Simon Peter replied, he said, don't just wash my feet, wash my hands, wash my head as well. Jesus said, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. You were clean, though not every, though not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said, not everyone was clean. Verse 12, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and he returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. And now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done. For very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. What an awesome story. You know, one of the most profound parts of the story for me is the humility of Christ, the Lamb of God, right? The Lord took off his outer garment, wrapped a towel around his waist, and began to wash the feet. And we see Jesus setting this example of humility as a leader. But, you know, I really think this is a foreshadowing, if you will. This is a, this is a picture also of what Christ was going to do. Christ was humbling himself in that moment so that he could wash the disciples and that they could be clean. And in the very near future, from, from what is happening here in this circle while Jesus is washing their feet, Jesus is going to humble himself to the point of death, even death on a cross, so that he could pay for the sins of the world. 
so that we might be clean. Jesus humbled himself. Now it's interesting. Jesus came in humility and he offered himself in humility. And when Jesus came to Peter, Peter had problem with what Jesus was doing because Peter thinks like you and I. He was thinking, hey, you know what? Masters don't wash servants' feet. It's the other way around. You know, Peter's right. It typically is that way, but not with Jesus. But Jesus said, look, Peter, if you want to receive what I have to offer, you have to let me wash you. Peter had to humble himself, didn't he, to receive what Jesus had to offer. Jesus' message hit home with Peter, and Peter said, Okay, I get it. Then Jesus, don't just wash my feet. Wash every single part of me. You know, there in that room, in that group of people, there was the opposite end of the spectrum. There was Judas who would not humble himself, and he did not humble himself. pride and fear you know whether our pride comes out of fear or anger and resentment toward God it keeps us from receiving what Jesus has to offer in our attempt to elevate ourselves we often destroy ourselves and our relationships, and the people around us. But when we humble ourselves, specifically as we're referring to the power of the gospel, if we will humble ourselves, then we will receive the transformation that Jesus has to offer. We'll be declared clean. And you know the most awesome picture of, of humility was displayed there on Golgotha's hill, right? When Jesus was crucified and he was nailed to that cross, the Lamb of God offering himself for the sins of the world. That's humility. That's Jesus. Jesus displayed great love and power through his humility. Let me ask you this, believer. Are you following Christ's example? Are you washing the feet literally literally and figuratively of those around you? Are you always staking your claim? defending your identity, trying to prove that you mean something, that you're valuable, walking in fear that, that, that people don't really hear you or, 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 or see you or have the wrong idea of, of who you are. And all that's just, it's Satan trying to destroy you. I'm not saying there's not sin in our life because there certainly is. But that's Satan's trap, right? To get us to try to live uh, in a place of pride, well, we won't admit. Just like that tax collector, he came to the place where he realized all he had was Jesus. My um, sister-in-law recently posted on Facebook, um, her and her husband lost their three sons to, to illness she said, you know, sometimes you don't realize Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. So let me tell you this, Jesus is all you have. And pride and arrogance is nothing but smoke and mirrors. So believer, 
maybe it's time to practice what you you know is the right thing, what the Holy Spirit is telling you to, to humble yourselves, to to be vulnerable with your husband or your wife, um, to not try to hold the power for yourself, right? Not to be, live in a in a in a p- position, a defensive position, always posturing, but instead just be open handed and open hearted before the Lord. Humility brings healing to relationship. You know what? Maybe there's somebody who are is hearing my words today who has never received the gift of forgiveness and eternal life that only Jesus can offer. Jesus can wash you clean. It doesn't matter who you are, where you've been, what you've been doing. Yes, those behaviors, God knows about them. And, and, and you can't get yourself clean from them. But the scripture says, if we will call on his name, he will save us. What did Jesus do? The Lamb of God came and he died on the cross. And in so doing, he paid for the sins of the world. Every dirty, nasty thing I did or you did. And scripture says that he was buried and on the third day he rose again. And he invites all of humanity into relationship with himself. He invites us to be like that tax collector, to bow our head and our heart before him and to cry out and say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Save me. You are what I need. We are living in a time. We are living among a people. We are a people who need to experience great spiritual awakening a return to humility listen the person who I was just talking to about that gift of forgiveness and eternal life and and forgiveness and, and the presence of God what you need to do is just bow your head and you need to pray you know and you might pray Something like this. Dear Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. And I know that you died to pay for my sins. Jesus, I know that you were buried. And on the third day, you rose again. Jesus, I ask you to forgive me and save me. Pray this in your name. Amen. The scripture says, if we will humble ourselves, He will save us. You know, God resists the proud, but He shows mercy to the humble. He resists the proud, but He shows mercy to the humble. We're often afraid of humility because of what it might mean, what it might communicate to others. But I think instead we should be afraid of pride. Because pride will take you farther away from the Lord than you want to be. And it'll keep you there longer than you want to stay. Thank you for... for listening to this message for joining me here today the lord bless you and keep you the lord make his face to shine down upon you you know what enjoy your family enjoy the people around you look after one another call somebody stop by and visit them see how they're doing love one another follow jesus's example Have a great day. Keep your head up. Talk to you soon.